talking before diving in with the intro that Miss Factors crew is like some of the best dancers of all time. My name is Jesse, and welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants program. If you're joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today is a whirlwind of an exciting day. This is our second of four programs happening just today, bringing all sorts of amazing nature to classrooms. I want to stress, too, that our month of May is all centered around our Backyard Bio Global Nature Campaign. So if you aren't familiar with this, we want to get your class out exploring, finding all the amazing local biodiversity near them so get outdoors check out backyardbio.net and see how you can get involved now today we are bringing back one of our very favorite people in a slightly new way we are heading to vermont to the vermont institute of natural sciences where over the last five years i swear we've been doing incredible programs with their birds of prey now you can check those all out on our youtube channel but today we are going to head out with educator Anna to learn about some of the amazing reptiles they have at this facility that's dedicated to rescuing, rehabilitating, re-releasing injured wildlife, and educating the public on the amazing world of nature. So, without further ado, I'm excited to turn it over to Anna, meet our unexpected friends today, and I hope you guys are too. Anna, thank you so much for joining us, and take us away. Absolutely. I'm always really excited to do these programs with you guys. So thank you for having us here. And with the little short change of notice, um, uh, hopefully we are excited to meet some of our reptiles today. So first, a little about me and a little about our organization. My name is Anna and I'm the lead environmental educator at the Vermont Institute of Natural Science, also known as VINS, and we're located in central Vermont. And our mission is to motivate people to care about the natural world. We do that through education, through research, and through wild bird rehabilitation. The education part of what we do, if you come visit us at our nature center, you'll get to see a bunch of different exhibits about native wildlife of Vermont. You'll also meet some of our ambassador animals. We have raptors, we have songbirds, and we have reptiles. And we also do other things like summer camps in the summertime, field trips during the school year. We were just hosting uh, this week our science symposium. So the local middle schoolers from a bunch of different schools have been working on science projects throughout the year um, on water uh, quality and the ecology of their own backyards. And they've just come here at Vince to present their research. So that's been a really fun link to our local uh, education. And we do this because we believe that the more people know about their local wildlife, the more likely they are to care and the better prepared we might all be to make small changes in the way that we live our lives that have huge beneficial impacts on the natural world. To that end, our research also helps to fuel this education. We wanna bring you guys accurate, up-to-date information, but we also want to know what are the impacts that human beings have on the wild, on the natural world? How might we make those impacts that we have more beneficial for wildlife as opposed to more challenging? Some of the things that we do as humans are real, real challenges for the natural world, but the more that we learn, the better we can be. Now, the last part of our mission is our wild bird rehabilitation. That just means that we have a bird hospital on site and we see injured and orphaned wild birds that members of the public bring to us for care. If you're out and about, you find a little baby bird and you're pretty certain that there's no parents around you've been watching for a long time and that baby bird seems to be all by itself. You can give a wildlife rehabilitator like us a call and we'll be able to take care of that baby until it's grown up and ready to return to the wild. And that's the goal with every single bird that comes to us. We want them to return to the wild because that's where they're happiest and healthiest. That's where they're contributing their role to the network of biodiversity all around us. So we're happy to be able to provide this service for our local birds. Um, but you'll notice no reptiles. We actually don't rehabilitate reptiles. And I like to say uh, it's because it's a very, very special person who will bring an injured snake into a wildlife hospital. It just doesn't happen all that often. Uh, and so we're not equipped to care for reptiles here. But we still have some ambassador reptiles. We still have, over the years, acquired animals from other nature centers and other facilities that needed to house these guys. And we wanted to be able to educate about this really awesome and really diverse group. And actually, our first ambassador is, I thought she was going to hang out in, under her heat lamp for a little while, and I, it would be easy enough for me to scoop her up, but she's just gone for a swim in the water. So I'm going to be dunking my hand into her, uh, her pool later to bring her out for you guys. But we are going to focus on those reptiles today. And I mentioned just one kind of reptile. I mentioned a snake. And I just also mentioned a turtle, 
Both snakes and turtles are reptiles. There's a lot of other reptiles out there too. There's lizards, count, um, crocodiles. They are part of the reptile group. Strangely enough, birds are part of the reptile group if we're being true to the uh, tree of life and including all the common ancestors of our modern reptiles. You have to include birds in that as well because as we know, birds are dinosaurs. Birds and dinosaurs are so closely related to each other and bird, the bird dinosaurs are very closely related to crocodiles and alligators. Now we're gonna meet two different ends of the reptile family tree today that aren't birds. We're going to meet some turtles and then we're going to meet a snake. And the reason why I say they are two different ends of the reptile family tree is because turtles represent a really ancient lineage of reptiles, a really old body plan of existing on our planet. Turtles are something like 300 or 400 million years old. That way of existing with a hard shell, with four legs, with scaly skin, has been around on our planet for almost 400 million years. By comparison, snakes are really modern. Snakes are new on the scene of reptiles. They maybe have only been around with us for a couple of dozen million years, which I know still sounds like a really long time, but compared to turtles, they're just babies on the evolutionary scale. So we're gonna meet those two different groups and talk about their adaptations and what makes them kind of unique and special and why should we care about any of that? So I'm gonna duck off uh, over here and try and convince Turt to emerge from her little summer dip right now so that she can join us in front of the camera. The, the classic query, how do you persuade a turtle to do stuff? We're going to find out together with Anna. I'm excited. <laughs> oh, that was easy. Flow <laughs> <laughs> running away. It is pretty easy. She's just wet now. So this right here is a very special member of our ambassador team. This is Turt. Uh, the wood turtle, and she's called Turt because we're not very creative with our reptile names, I must say. Um, but she's called a wood turtle for a very specific reason. Wood turtles are actually a really uh, interesting species of turtle. They're native to New England, uh, but they are considered an endangered species. They're considered an endangered species globally because the only place where they're easily found is in New England. We're kind of the last stronghold of their range. The habitat of the wood turtle, as you might expect, is woods. They love living in forests and especially in areas that have a nice flowing stream with a lot of riffles, meaning the water is flowing over rocks. And so it's really well aerated. That stream has a lot of motion. It has a lot of different um, geography between the rocks and the muddy banks. Maybe there are tree roots sticking out of those banks and they can climb up out of the stream or they can hide down underneath the rocks in the stream depending on their temperature needs. But that is not actually why they're called wood turtles. They're called wood turtles because of the interesting pattern on their back. So if I show you Turt's carapace, this is the top part of the shell. Turtles have two different parts to their protective shell, the carapace on top and the plastron on the bottom. Her plastron is particularly gorgeous. She's got lots of bright orange coloration there. But on the carapace, if you take a close look at the individual scutes or the individual scales that make up her shell, she has 13 of them. If you were to count all of these scales right here, you'd find that there are 13. And actually, the Native Americans of our region, the Abenaki people, they considered 13 to be a really lucky number because that's how many scales are on the back of a turtle. But each individual skew has these concentric rings to it. And that might remind you of something else that we find in nature. When you cut down a tree, you see rings inside of the tree. And if you think about what do the rings in a tree tell you about the tree? And what might the rings on a wood turtle tell you about the wood turtle? You'll realize that it's about aging. The number of rings in a tree tell you how old the tree is, and the number of rings on the scutes of a wood turtle tell you how old the turtle is, up to a certain point. Wood turtles actually stop growing so much when they are 10 or 15 years old. So turtles actually, as big as she's going to be, and she has about 15 rings per scute, so we can say she is at least 15 years old. But beyond that, it becomes a little bit harder to age her. Fortunately, we know how long that she has been with humans 
and she's been with humans since 1976, which makes her 46 years old this year. And we're very lucky to have her. She came to live with us at VINs in 1985. So she's been at VINs longer than any of the staff that are still working here have been at VINs. So she is uh, truly uh, a venerable uh, education ambassador with us. So that's why they're called the wood turtles. They have the concentric rings like you find inside of wood that help you tell their age. Now, Turt here, this individual turtle, she came to live with us because she had been hit by a car. The previous facility that housed her, they actually rehabilitated her after she was hit by a car. But turtles heal so slowly, they do a lot of things slowly, that she still has a scar on her shell from where she was hit. Now, turtles do get hit by cars, and it's unfortunately a, a frequent thing that occurs. And people might wonder, well, why? What are they what are they even doing in the roads? Shouldn't they be hanging out in streams or in the forest? And it's true that that's where they spend most of their time. But at a critical time of year, they're on the move. Many, many different turtle species, wood turtles, painted turtles, snapping turtles are the common ones up here in Vermont. They move pretty far away from a stream to lay their eggs. And the reason why they wanna move pretty far away from the stream is they don't want their nest to get flooded out. They don't want that uh, the spring rains or the summer rains to flood the river so high that it floods into the nest and then those eggs are going to be killed. They, they can no longer hatch if they've been doused with water. So she needs to travel um, about a kilometer or maybe half a mile away from the uh, edge of her stream in order to dig a hole in some sandy, sandy soil and lay about 20 or 30 eggs. So when turtles are on the move like this, they might encounter the road that runs alongside of their stream and need to get across that road. And as we know, they don't move very fast and they can't get out of the way of cars. So it might be that you're in a situation um, upcoming this summer or in the fall where you're driving down the road with your parents and you see a, a turtle sitting in the middle of the road. You can actually help them. If it's safe for you and your family to pull the car over to the side of the road and to get out, you can help the turtle move across the road. The uh, best way to do it is to pick up the turtle from behind. If it's a small turtle like this, you can just grab her right over her tail, right there on the back of the shell, like you're holding, I don't know, a taco, and then move her to the side of the road that she was facing. It's important not to move the turtle back in the other direction from which they came because they're just going to start their journey all over again. They know where they're going. They know exactly where, where they want to go. So picking them up and moving them to the other side of the road is really, really helpful. Now I did mention snapping turtles. I'm actually gonna put Turt back in her enclosure so she can enjoy her, her um, dip in the pool back here to show you a snapping turtle shell because that is a very different animal. If you come across a turtle in the road that has uh, the edge of its carapace on the back here, these serrated teeth, these are not really teeth. I just think they look like shark teeth. That's a pretty good indication that you're looking at a snapping turtle. And the snapping turtles, what do they do? They snap. That's a great way that they have of defending themselves from predators. They rely both on their big thick shell so that things can't bite into them and also on their powerful jaw muscles. So they can grab onto something and crunch it down. You don't want to get grabbed and crunched by a snapping turtle. That it's just not gonna work. And they have really, really long necks. So it's not safe to pick them up from behind. They might actually be able to reach around and bite you. So what I do if I find a snapping turtle that needs help crossing the road is I just keep my snow shovel in my car all year round. I use the snow shovel to scoop up the snapping turtle and move it where it's going. That way I never have to touch it and I never have to worry about my own safety. This snapping turtle shell is from a turtle that was probably 30 or 40 years old. So uh, about the same age as our wood turtle, but you notice quite a bit bigger. Snapping turtles grow to about this size, like a really, really large dinner plate. Now, if any of you are from Florida, you might know about alligator snapping turtles, which is another species of snapping turtle in North America. 
Um, they only are found in Florida. So we don't have any alligator snapping turtles up here in New England, and they can get much bigger than the common snapping turtle. But I think these guys are plenty big enough. So that's a little bit about our classical kind of aquatic turtles, the wood turtle and the snapping turtle. We're gonna meet another turtle right now who is very different from both of them. And she's right over here. Ooh, mystery turtle just off camera. What could it be? I'm kind of excited. By the way, if you want to learn more about the indigenous history with turtles, we did a program literally the other day with the amazing Ontario Park team talking all about that map and uh, the calendar on turtles back and all sorts of neat stuff. So it was a great follow. That's cool. Yeah. I map. want to learn more about that too. That's so cool. So we have another turtle here. This is Jersey. Jersey's from New Jersey originally. And we think that she too was hit by a car, but when she was very young, she actually spent the first 30 years of her life living with a family in New Jersey as a pet. Uh, and when they moved up to Vermont, it's actually not legal in Vermont to keep this species of turtle as a pet. And so they donated her to our nature center so that she could start a, a new life as an education ambassador. So she's in her late thirties now and has been with us for about five years or so. But this is a different kind of turtle entirely. And I want you guys to take a good look at her body shape, at her carapace right here, at her plastron underneath. Not nearly as colorful as the wood turtle, right? But there's also a big shape difference. This turtle has a really high dome shell. It's not flat and smooth and streamlined the way that the wood turtles was. It kind of comes up really high. This normally would be a clue to you that this might be a tortoise rather than a turtle. You might have heard of the difference between tortoises and turtles. In general, tortoises live on land a lot and turtles live in the water for a lot of their life. In addition, tortoises have feet that are kind of elephant-like. They're really like a column with short toes, whereas turtles tend to have webbed toes that allow them to swim better. Makes sense, right? This right here is a confusing turtle because she is rather tortoise-like, but she still is a turtle. She has a high dome shell, but she has little webs in between her feet. She spends some time in water, but not a lot really. This is a box turtle and box turtles are considered turtles, but they're probably the most terrestrial or land living of any of the turtle species. Now, the reason why she's called a box turtle is not just because she has this nice high dome shell that's really squared off. It actually has to do with the plastron instead of the carapace. If I bring her a little closer to the camera, you might be able to see that it seems like her plastron is in two parts. She's got a little upper part here and a lower part. And the two parts of the plastron are joined by this little hinge. And this is just skin, that hinge right there. And it allows the plastron to move in two different pieces, like a door hinge. So that when a box turtle gets frightened by maybe a predator or a really loud noise or a sudden vibration, she feels like she's in danger and needs to pull inside of her shell. She'll pull in her little tiny stubby tail, her back legs, her front legs, her head, and then the top part of her plastron, the forward part will hinge up and meet the bottom of her carapace. And the back part will hinge up and meet the bottom of her carapace over here. So she can enclose herself completely like you'd close a box. And that's why they're called box turtles. There are many different species of box turtles. All of them have the hinged plastron that allows them to entirely close their shell. So they're very, very well protected from any sort of thing that might want to come along and eat them. And there are quite a variety of animals in their environment that might eat them. Eastern box turtles, like this species, are found all up and down the East Coast. We're about the farthest north here in Vermont that you would see uh, Eastern box turtles. So I doubt that in Quebec or Ontario that you would uh, see them naturally roaming around in the wild. But in more southern parts of their range, they're pretty common. And their box is not their only defense mechanism. They're also pretty well camouflaged. I said she wasn't that colorful, but if I could bring her close to the camera and you can see some of the patterning on her shell, I really love this. It looks like um, the dappled light that falls down through the forest onto the forest floor from the sunlight passing through some leaves. 
So if she decided, you know what, I'm just gonna take a little rest here in this pile of leaves, she would blend right in, even with the shifting sunlight because of that pattern on her shell. So if you are a coyote or a raccoon or a fox and you're interested in eating a turtle, first you have to locate her and then you have to surprise her before she can totally close herself in her shell. And she can do that really, really fast. And, and get away from you pretty easily. So Jersey here, as I mentioned, she actually uh, is one turtle that we can tell the difference between the males and the females. In fact, it's actually pretty easy in turtles, but I'll give you a secret about box turtles in particular. I'm showing you her little face. She does have some strawberry on her face because she just finished eating breakfast. But you see her eyes. She's got beautiful brown eyes, like my brown eyes. Uh, and if she were a male box turtle, she would have bright red eyes. So the very distinctive difference between the males and the females here, and it's probably important for them to identify each other because all the rest of their body is enclosed inside of a shell. So she's uh, pretty excited to get back into her home. So I'm gonna let her go and do that so that we can uh, move along and meet our snakes. That will be the next and the last reptile that we get to meet. I must admit, while we're waiting together for the snakes to come in, that I am a huge fan of snakes. I know a lot of our friends might be afraid of snakes. You might be a little nervous around them. They've always been my very favorite kind of animal in the world. So I hope by the end of this talk with Anna today, you feel a little bit of the same way. So, you know, reduce that fear a little bit and just become really curious about a really special group of creatures. So excited. Maybe it's an anaconda. I doubt it. Oh yeah. Ooh, <laughs> I, I totally get that. I personally, I've never had a fear of snakes whatsoever, but yeah. I know a lot of people who just like, yeah, maybe keep that away from me. <laughs> <laughs> so this right here, this is Wilmington. Actually, he has the most creative name. He's from Wilmington, Vermont originally, and he is a corn snake. Now that's a funny name, like the wood turtle. What? It does have an obvious answer. Maybe they hang out in cornfields and that is kind of true. You can find corn snakes hanging out in cornfields in the southern part of their range. They are an eastern snake, so we're only talking east of the Appalachians. But the real reason why they're called their corn snake is something on their body. If you look at the scales that are on his belly, these belly scales right here, there's sort of a black and white checkerboard pattern to them. He's like, ooh, you're warm. I'm gonna move around a lot. This black and white checkerboard pattern you might think maybe a better name is a checkerboard snake, but there's also a lot of um, a wild corn, corn that has uh, multiple colored kernels to it, that kind of decorative dried corn or maize that you might put on your house in the fall. People thought that the snake looks exactly like that decorative corn, and so that is how they got the name of corn snake. Now snakes, as I mentioned, they're a really, really modern lineage of reptiles. So if that turtle body plan of having a big thick shell moving through life slowly but well protected, that works well for them. Snakes are just kind of figuring out how to be a really, really good, well adapted animal and they're doing a great job. Snakes, there is a, a really great story that we get from native peoples about um, how snakes lost their legs. And we, we thought that they probably once had legs and they no longer do. And generally the stories are about something, something that snake did wrong or something, uh, someone tricked snake into um, uh, having her take off her legs and leave them behind. But we do know from looking at the fossil record of ancient reptiles, when we're looking for dinosaurs and we're looking for lizards, we know that the very first ancestors of snakes, they did have legs. And so snakes over evolutionary time, they lost their legs. And it might seem to us who have two very, very useful legs, like a really disadvantage, like a bummer. Like why would you get rid of your legs? Until you think about the snake's particular lifestyle. Snakes are carnivores. So this corn snake, he's not gonna be eating corn. He's gonna be in those cornfields eating the things that eat the corn, like mice and voles and rats. In fact, another name for the corn snake is the red rat snake because of how many rats they can eat. So a really useful animal for agriculture, a really great thing for farmers to have in their field, providing them with some pest control. But in order to catch those animals, those mice, they might try and run away and hide from a snake and they live down in a narrow burrow. They live in a hole that they've dug 
at the base of a tree or right there in the middle of the field. And if you had big bulky legs, you might have to spend a lot of time digging up that burrow. Maybe the mouse could escape by the time that you dug all the way in to get it. But if you don't have any legs at all, you've just got a tiny little head and a slender long body, you can follow that mouse right down into its hole. It's not safe anymore. It thinks it's safe because it wasn't thinking about the fact that you might be a snake and you can just follow, slither right down behind that mouse. So it provides them with the ability to hunt animals in places that other predatory animals can't. It also makes them kind of all terrain, which I love. If you are an animal that has legs and feet, you probably have a certain kind of feet. Maybe you're a duck that has webbed feet that help you to paddle through the water, but those feet aren't really great for walking on land. Maybe you have really long legs that help you walk in the mud, but those really long legs, they aren't good when you have to deal with snow, for example. Snakes, don't have to worry about that. They can crawl up vertical surfaces so long as there's a little rock to hang on to. They can crawl up into a tree. They can hang out on the ground. They can go swimming in the water. Every possibility is open to them. So snakes are really, really versatile, adaptable creatures. And we have many, many different species of snakes around the world. Only 11 of them here in Vermont. And that's because here in Vermont, it's kind of a hard existence for reptiles. You might be thinking about the fact that reptiles are cold-blooded or what we would call ectothermic. Ecto meaning outside of the body and thermic meaning heat. Reptiles need their heat from the outside world, from the sunlight, from the warmth of the sun beating down on a particular rock. They'll like to hang out in that heated space because they can't generate their own body heat very easily. That means that winter in Vermont is a really, really tough time for these guys. And so they do a kind of hibernation. For reptiles, both the turtles and the snakes, that hibernation is called brumation. And in general, snakes will do it uh, socially. They'll get together with a bunch of their family and friends in a big giant snake knot ball in a burrow underground that they borrow from another larger animal. And they'll sleep away the winter together, reducing their body heat, reducing their need to take in food and reducing their need to even breathe air for the duration of the winter to keep themselves alive while there isn't a lot of food or warmth available. So these animals are just fascinating. And I like to remind people how vital they are as a part of our ecosystem. They, just like the raptors, the owls and the hawks that eat mice and rats, these snakes do that too. And so it's important that they live beside us to help us manage the populations of those small rodents. Plus, they're also just really beautiful. I happen to think that the corn snakes in particular are just gorgeous, gorgeous animals. And if you get over that momentary moment of seeing a snake and thinking, oh, oh no, dangerous, then you take a chance to get to know them. They're really, really amazing animals that can be really intelligent as well. But I don't blame anybody who has a fear of snakes. It's a perfectly natural thing. Uh, our ancestors, our human ancestors that evolved in Africa, evolved in a place where many of the snakes are very, very dangerous. And so it paid our ancestors very well to have a healthy respect for snakes. We can have a healthy respect for snakes so long as you kind of live and let live. Let a snake do its snake thing. It's, it just wants to let you do your human thing. You can part ways without harming each other in any way. So that's a little bit about our corn snakes, our snakes and our turtles as well. He's just content to hang out on me. So I think he'll hang yeah. out while we do questions. I wish I had a snake to hang out on me while we were talking as well, but that is very, very cool. And, and again, I want to stress, actually, I'm just going to bring this up now because I'll forget otherwise. You talked about snakes all gathering together. Some of our Canadian classes may not know that the biggest group of snakes in the world is in Manitoba, the Narcissus snake dens. This is increasingly being featured in a lot of natural history documentaries because it's yes. so spectacular. But everyone should look up Manitoba garter snakes or the snake dens below. It'll blow your mind how many snakes can be in one area. It's really, really cool. It's ridiculous. Yes, I know about that site. I've never been. I want to I want to see it for my myself. But yes, yeah, I'll, I'll catch you there some year. We'll head together. Yeah. Um, let's head to this Baxter's class first. Welcome in, guys. Let's go to Ontario. Grade two. Welcome in. Hi, guys. Do you have any questions for Anna? Hello. Hello. What do we want to ask about turtles or snakes, guys? What's the question, Claire? 
What do we do if someone's going to build a road where a turtle's about to lay its eggs? Or how do we help yeah. turtles? How do we help turtles if that's going to happen? Oh, that's such a great question because I think the answer to that involves community action. It involves a bunch of people getting together, knowing that there is a problem, and using their voices to say, hey, you know what? We don't want this road built here because we would rather have this place free for turtles to lay their eggs. Let's see if we can build this road somewhere else, somewhere that's less dangerous for our wildlife. And that's something that we're working on with our research department with uh, amphibians as well. Frogs and salamanders that need places to cross the roads. It may not be a good idea to build your road right next to a wetland we're discovering. Um, yeah. But yeah, get together and use your voices to make change. If you want to see one of the turtle uh, corridors in action, actually, again, that turtle program we did the other day with Ontario Parks. If you guys want to check that out, it's really, really cool how they funnel the turtles through areas to help them avoid going over the road, just like we described. So very, very cool question, Ms. Baxter's group. Speaking of Ontario, Mr. Bocci's class joining us in Toronto. Grade fives, if you guys have a question for us, grade fours, come on in. Hey, guys. Hi. Um, Hi. Henry, and I want to know... What's the top speed of a turtle on land? Oh, ooh, top that is a really good question. I don't know that I have a number to give you, Henry, but I know that I have seen some painted turtles, which are turtle, like a tiny bit smaller than a wood turtle, just book it. Like, definitely moving faster than I would, could comfortably walk. Definitely not something that could outrun me. <laughs> but definitely faster than a walking speed. And I know that my walking speed is about three miles per hour, so I'm faster than that. <laughs> I like that. Very cool. If you if a turtle can outrun you, I think you've got bigger problems. You should probably check it out. Yeah, more. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Miss Stevens class joining us today in California. Welcome in and banning. One and twos, if you guys want to share a question, just unmute your mic, turn on your camera, come on back in. And I'll give you a second to do that while we bring up a quick question from YouTube. So Ms. Sterling's class joining us, Merwin Greer, uh, they want to know, is the corn snake venomous? Your friend on your on your back there. I would not be letting him do this if he was venomous. No, corn snakes are constrictors. Uh, you might have heard of a ball python or a boa constrictor. Uh, those are both constrictor snakes that their main way of killing their prey is they will bite it and then they'll wrap their body around it several times and then they'll squeeze and they'll squeeze so hard that they asphyxiate the animal. So it can no longer breathe. Its heart can no longer pump blood around its body. They're just out and then the snake can swallow them whole. So no venom necessary. Yeah. If uh, anyone's ever had the chance to hold a snake, you'll know that even though they're small animals, and certainly this one is, uh, they're immensely powerful. Very, very strong muscles. Very muscular. Like they're gripping you tightly. Um, they're, they're very fantastic. Well, I love holding snakes. Uh, let's take another one from YouTube, and then we'll head back to our live classes. Miss Stevens, if you do have any queries, just let me know. Turn on those devices, and we'll come to you live. Uh, but Miss Fisher's class in Carsonville, Michigan, wants to know, how long can turtles be out of water, Anna? Ooh, how long can turtles be out of water? Indefinitely. So turtles need to breathe air. In fact, all reptiles need to breathe air. Even sea turtles that spend their entire lives in the ocean, except for coming up on land to breed, they need to breathe air. Um, so turtles can actually drown uh, if they're not allowed out some time out in the open air. Um, so indefinitely is the answer. Turtles uh, should have access to water uh, if you're caring for them in uh, a human setting like this, but it is not necessary for their life. They don't have gills. I, I was going to say, I'm really glad you mentioned this. So a lot of people, when creatures live in or around the water, they wonder if they can currently live there. If they don't have those gills, which fish have, a lot of other deep sea creatures have, octopus, things that are able to extract oxygen from the water. If you lack that, if you have those lungs, just like we do, you're not able to breathe in the water. You have to come up to the surface to breathe. So dolphins in the water, another good example of a creature that can't just swim in the water all the time, right. has to come up for those breaths. All right, Mr. McEwen's class, welcome in at the Nickel School in Calgary. You guys have such great questions all the time. Uh, this is the first one. Do you have any salt water turtles there? Is it all freshwater species? Ooh. 
We only have freshwater species here because Vermont is a landlocked state and we uh, focus on native species. So we don't have any saltwater turtles um, uh, here with us, unfortunately, in Vermont. <laughs> If you want to check out a place that does have saltwater turtles, the Turtle Hospital in Florida, we've done many programs with on our YouTube channel. You can check that out as a follow-up. Let's head back to Ms. Baxter's class. Come on back in grade twos and take us away. Hey, guys. All right. Um, do turtles shed like snakes and lizards? Oh, very good question. They, they don't really. They do a little bit when they're young and they're growing. So our wood turtle, she probably had a few of her uh, scutes flake off as she was growing, um, but it's not anything like what snakes do. In fact, I have... I have a recent shed of Wilmington's right here. Yeah, so he's about five feet long. This is how long he is. And this is his, uh, from a very, very recent shed. So you know about ecdysis, about the fact that snakes shed all of their skin. They shed it all in one go whenever they need to grow larger because their scales aren't able to grow with them. So if he feels at this point in his life, he's growing wider rather than longer. But if he feels like he needs a little more room, he uh, will start to shed and all the skin comes off at once. Lizards do it a little bit differently. Uh, lizards shed their skin all in one go, but it does tend to flake off uh, in pieces and they will eat their skin once it's off of them, uh, kind of recycle those nutrients. But turtles really don't shed uh, their scales in the same way as snakes uh, and lizards at all. Yeah. Good question. Very good question. I, I hope our classes, you've had the chance to hold a snake skin. They're really unique and, and such fascinating mm -hmm. things to yeah. talk uh, Mr. Bocci's class, we'll head to you guys and we'll take a few from YouTube. YouTube classes, you guys are crazy. I love all your questions. This is fantastic. Bocci, come on back in. Um, what's the most venomous snake? Ooh, the most venomous snake. I know this if you don't, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have to lean on Jesse for this. I'm normally the raptor person. I don't know this. Okay, well, I'm a snake nerd since birth. So the Inland Tapen, uh, a snake that's in the middle of the heart of Australia, has classically the most potent venom in the world. This is a snake that if it bit you, you'd walk about a step and a half before you killed over dead. This, so there are several snakes in the world that are so, so venomous that if they bite you, you are inevitably not going to survive. There are not very many of them, and they're usually in very, very remote places, but you'll find it in desert species a lot because they have to have very potent venom to bite something and have it die very quickly so that it doesn't escape them and get too far away. Uh, so Inland Tapen, T-A-I-P-A-N, very, very cool nice. snake. Miss Stevens, you're in now. Come on in, unmute your mic, and uh, take us away with a question. Hi. Hi, Diego from my first grade class has a question. Go ahead, Diego. Hopefully they can hear you. Yeah. Um, how long do turtles live? Ooh, how long do turtles live? Question. It de does depend on the turtle somewhat. So in general, the rule is the bigger they can grow, the longer they can live. So our small turtles, like painted turtles, like eastern box turtles, can live to be 90 or 100. It's a really long time. Our larger turtles, like the Galapagos tortoises that live on the Galapagos Islands, that are enormous tortoises, like bigger than a pig, this kind of size. They think they can live to be more than 250 years old. Um, so it's a really long time. Very yeah. cool. By the way, I've never heard an analogy to a pig, but that's amazing. So thank you very much for that. Um, we'll take a few from YouTube. We're whipping through this. So many great questions. Okay. Um, Miss Fisher's class wants to know, Amelia wants to know, is it safe to touch a garter snake? I think this is a very important question. Yes. So it's a good question because I'm inclined to say, why are you touching the garter snake? Is it to move it out of the way of something dangerous or is it just for funsies to pick up the garter snake? Um, it is safe if you don't mind your hands smelling really, really bad for days afterward. Garter snakes are not venomous, but their defense mechanism is to musk. So they have a kind of gross little liquid secretion that they will do out of their, where the hole, where everything else comes. And it's not pee, but it smells terrible. And it has a really good way of sticking to your hands, no matter how many times you wash your hands. So you're gonna smell bad. 
uh, after you pick up a garter snake. <laughs> you are. As if you know, you can dart through the bush to grab garter snakes. I no longer do that. I love the experience of getting to interact with a reptile in that way. Um, I was very, very careful when I did it, of course. But now, typically, when I go into the woods, I see a snake. I recognize it. I acknowledge it. It's beautiful. I take a picture, and I leave it on its merry way. And you avoid being mussed, which is a good thing to avoid. It really is quite horrible. Yes. All right. Two more for you, Anna. Um, Mr. McEwen's class wants to know, Natalie asks, what's the largest turtle? Ooh, I think that goes to the Galapagos turtles um, that are on the Galapagos Islands. Yes, yeah, but there are a number, number of other tortoises uh, that get enormous, like the Aldabra tortoise uh, that I believe is found in, in deserts in Africa. And don't forget about leatherback sea turtles, man. Leatherback sea turtles get really, really huge. Um, they get to be a ton, one ton, as big as, a, like, so in Miss Baxter's class, in our classes of grade one and grade two students, add all the weight of all the kids in your class together, and that's one leatherback turtle. So yep. you, are, you are as big as one turtle as a classroom, which is very, very cool. All right, I love this question from Miss Sterling's class. We'll wrap it up with this. Are there any reptiles that have gills, even in the past, like prehistoric reptiles? Ooh, Yeah. It's a good question because there are some very bizarre reptiles out there. Um, prehistoric, so prehistoric animals that had gills generally were amphibians. So if they're if they're on land and they have gills, they're probably spending some time in the water as well. Um, I'll tell you what I do know about the kind of ancestral gill thing, and it's a really fun fact that makes me like super bummed out that I am a human being and not like a snake or an owl or something really cool. But the reason why your blood vessels in your neck are right here on the surface, really close to the skin, seems like a disadvantage, right? To have these vital blood vessels like so close to the surface of your skin is because that's where your gills used to be. In our ancestors, that is where the oxygen exchange would have happened right on the sides of the head, on the neck. And so you need to have your blood vessels be right there so they can pick up the oxygen from the water and dump off the carbon dioxide. Um, so any animal whose faraway ancestors had gills has their blood vessels in their neck right there at the surface of the skin. And very that's true of snakes, it's true of turtles. So long ago, yes. <laughs> very, very cool. And I will stress, so uh, it's it can be confusing. Evolution works in a mysterious way sometimes. So you end up with things like whales, which are in the water now, but have to breathe air. Whales' ancestors were on land. So life came from the water, came onto land, and subsequently some of that life went back to the water. But all the yeah. things that started on land do have to breathe air, do have to come back out, don't have those gills as we discussed earlier. Great question, guys. Anna, this is so much fun. Uh, we could dive into this all day. I love that Oliver in Mr. Raji's class says the box turtle looks like the one from Kung Fu Panda. It absolutely does, so thank you for that. Uh, that's that's great. Great. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I want to highlight, too, for our folks at home, I know we did talk about reptiles today. If you do want to dive in with birds, not only do we have our YouTube channel, but Anna and I filmed a really, really fun Kahoot together on the Owls and Raptors at Vim. So if you want to check it out at the Kahoot Challenge below, I'll make sure all our classes have that in the chat on StreamYard and on YouTube. You can play along and have a lot of fun to wrap up the broadcast. Uh, Anna, is there a last message you want to share with us about these reptiles before we bring in our classes to say thank you and farewell? It's a good question. I think the, the thing that I like sharing about reptiles is how important education is for their conservation specifically. Um, a lot of people love pandas and tigers and eagles and owls, and not a lot of people are all that fond of snakes. So it's they're just as important as a piece of all of our ecosystems all around the world. And the thing I think that's going to help them out the most is if more people know the facts about reptiles the cool things that they do and dispelling the myths that we have that they're slimy or all venomous or all dangerous. So education is a huge part of reptile conservation. And that's something that you guys are now well equipped to do. You've learned some stuff about reptiles today. You can share that information with your friends and your family, and you'll be helping with reptile conservation just by doing that. 
Outstanding. I, certainly, I, I love when we emphasize the education angle. And again, I, I hope you take the opportunity to talk to your friends and family about snakes, especially. Turtles, people tend to like a little more. Snakes are a little misunderstood. Uh, and play that goo challenge. If you've got an extra 10 minutes in your class, head out, check it out, learn more about owls and raptors, some amazing stuff that we've done with Vins over the last five years. And so as Anna well knows, having done like 30, 40 programs together, we're going to bring in all our classes today. A big thank you and farewell. If you're on YouTube and you want to scream and yell too, great. But Miss Baxter, Mr. Bucket, Ms. Stevens Group, thank you so much for being here. Have a wonderful day, guys. Bye for now, everyone. Bye.